All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for our technical assistance informational webinar for the Transformative Research Award. June 29th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Visit commonfund.nih.gov slash TRA for more information, including application guidance. So a few quick housekeeping notes. The webinar is being recorded and we will make the recording available on our website for your viewing and sharing with others sometime within the next two weeks or so. We will also make the slides available on the website for you to be able to download. Uh, if you have any questions that we do not get to, please feel free to contact us via the Transformative Research mailbox. And the email address is listed on this slide. Um, the email address for the Early Independence Award mailbox is transformative underscore awards at mail.nih.gov. Please also, during the webinar, use the chat box if you are having any issues or if you would like to introduce yourself and use the Q&A box if you have any questions. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, I would love to introduce our panelists. I am Makiba Charles Ayinde, and I am a health science policy analyst with the Office of the Director. We also have Becky Miller. Becky is a program officer also in the Office of the Director. We have Ravi Basavapa. Ravi is our program leader of the High Risk, High Reward or HRHR program. And that is where the Transformative Research Award sits. That's where it's housed. We are very lucky to have James Lee join us. And James is the Scientific Review Officer with the Center for Scientific Review. And he sort of governs the review process. And then to wrap us up, we have Ellie Mercia. And Ellie is a program specialist with the Office of the Director as well. Ellie keeps us on track. She makes sure that we complete all the necessary paperwork so that we can bring these opportunities to you. So let's get started. We will start with an overview of the Common Fund, which is in the Office of the Director. The Common Fund is run in the Office of Strategic Coordination. And what is truly special about the Common Fund is that we create programs that are meant to address major scientific roadblocks that require a trans NIH response. So when you look at our programs at a glance, you can separate them into four buckets, which you see on this colorful slide in front of you. Thank you, Becky. The four program buckets include data, tools, and methods, new types of clinical partnerships, new paradigms, and transformative workforce support. Uh, if you look at the data, tools, and methods bucket, you'll find programs such as Bridge to Artificial Intelligence or Bridge to AI. And the intent of that program is to generate data sets and best practices for machine learning analysis. And, and then we also have the Gabrielle Miller Kids First Pediatric Research Program, or Kids First, because we shorten everything here. Uh, that is, that program intends on developing a large scale database of clinical and genetic data from patients with childhood cancers and structural birth defects, as well as their families. Other programs listed in Data, Tools, and Methods include Cellular Senescence Network, CENNET, Genotype Tissue Expression, GTEx, Glycoscience, Human Biomolecular Atlas Program, HubMap, Illuminating the Druggable Genome, IDG, Knockout Mouse Phenotyping, COMP, Metabolomics, Protein Capture Reagents, Library of Integrated Network-Based Cellular Signatures, LINCS, Science of Behavior Change, SOBC, 
somatic cell genome editing, SCGE, stimulating peripheral activity to relieve conditions, SPARC, and transformative high-resolution cryo-electron microscopy, cryo-EM. In the new paradigms bucket, we have, for instance, the physical activity consortium, and that consortium is looking at the impact of physical activity on our body. So we all know that exercise is good for you, but what is actually happening in the body that makes it so good? Other programs listed in new paradigms include 4D nucleome, 4DN, extracellular RNA communication, xRNA. Then we also have the clinical partnerships bucket. And if you look at that, that bucket, we have the undiagnosed diseases network. And that network brings together a lot of stakeholders so that patients, clinicians, scientists, they can all work together to diagnose rare diseases. So we're basically building a network of folks that can work collaboratively to move the needle on a major roadblock. Other programs listed in new types of clinical partnerships include acute to chronic pain signatures, A2CPS, Global Health, Harnessing Data Science for Health Discovery and Innovation in Africa, DSI Africa, HCS Research Collaboratory, and Nutrition for Precision Health, powered by the All of Us Research Program. And then the fourth bucket, the most special bucket, we have the Transformative Workforce Support Bucket, and that's where the Transformative Research Award sits under the High Risk, High Reward Program. The High Risk, High Reward Research Program includes the Pioneer, New Innovator, Transformative Research, and Early Independence Awards. Other programs listed in the Transformative Workforce Support include Enhancing the Diversity of the NIH-Funded Workforce, DPC slash Build, Faculty Institutional Recruitment of Sustainable Transformation, FIRST, and transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity. So, next slide, Becky. The reason why this is all important is that these programs may have funding opportunities available to you, specifically if there are programs that are relevant to your scientific area, but also because a marked number of these programs make freely accessible to you data, instruments, reagents, protocols. So we would like to highly encourage you to visit the Common Fund website at commonfund.nih.gov so that you can learn more about these additional opportunities. Next slide. So these programs that I mentioned are all fantastic, but today we would like to share with you more about the high risk, high reward program. And next slide. The, the high risk, high reward program has four initiatives. The Pioneer Award, the New Innovator Award, the Transformative Research Award, as well as the Early Independence Award. All four of these have annual funding opportunities that tend to be released in the spring and have closing deadlines in August and September. So it's important because right now, as we speak, we have four funding opportunities that are open to accept applications. Next slide. Each of these awards have nuances that make eligibility different. However, in all four, we are looking for high risk, high impact ideas. Next slide. We also do not require preliminary data or detailed experimental plans. And please trust us when we say we do not need preliminary data to apply for these programs. We recognize that if you have an innovative or an out of the box idea, you may not have the data to support that idea. Um, Feasibility is important, but you do not need to have experiments that were already run and data available at the time that you submit. 
Next slide. We welcome any topic that is relevant to the NIH mission. So we know that this can be a broad umbrella. Basically, we're looking for applications with any topic that is relevant to behavioral sciences, social sciences, applied, formal sciences, clinical, translational, or basic research. And we are always trying to expand our portfolio. So if you look at our website right now and you look at the projects that we've funded in the past, you may not see something that fits exactly into your scientific area. Uh, or that you may be interested in studying. Please, please do not be discouraged by that. We just may not have found you and your idea yet. So once it falls under the NIH mission, please apply. Next slide. We should also mention that we recognize that great science comes from a variety of backgrounds. So we highly encourage applications from scientists, from diverse backgrounds, from diverse institutions, and as I mentioned earlier, diverse scientific areas. Research topics relevant to the NIH's mission include behavioral, social, biomedical, applied and formal sciences, and basic translational or clinical research. So perhaps if you are coming from a more teaching institution or a private laboratory, once you are eligible to apply as an institution, we welcome your application. Next slide. So before I go on any further, I would like to recognize our NIH High Risk High Reward Working Group. Slide showing the chair, program leader, and 49 working group members and their organizations for the High Risk, High Reward Research Program. The full list of working group members can be found at commonfund.nih.gov slash high risk slash members. Uh, we have representatives from almost every institute and center. And these are the people that make it possible for us to run such a large program and because this is truly a trans NIH initiative, we rely heavily on their expertise and with them helping us to manage the program and to give us direction. Next slide. So enough of me talking, I would like to hand over to Ravi so he can dive deeper into the Transformative Research Award Program. Ravi? Thank you very much, Makiba, for the introduction and for the overview of the Common Fund and the High Risk High Reward Research Program. And thank you for all of those of you attending as prospective applicants. As Makiba said, we'll focus in this webinar on the Transformative Research Award Initiative. The intention of this initiative is to support exceptionally innovative, unconventional research projects that have uh, uh, the potential to have broad impact. To, for example, to create or overturn fundamental paradigms. Bit of history, the Transformative Research Award initiative was started in 2009. This was actually an outgrowth of the enhancing peer review process that was taking place at NIH at the time. Then it was recognized that, yes, we do have the new, new innovator awards and pioneer awards for supporting high risk, high reward research, but those are limited to single PI applications and the budgets are fixed. And there was really no opportunity for teams of investigators to come together or single or individuals for teams to propose ideas with uh, flexible budgets. In response to that observed need, the Transformative Research Award initiative was started. It is open to individuals uh, or teams at all career stages. So it's open to single PIs as well as multi PIs, whatever is appropriate for the project being proposed. As Makiba said, no preliminary data are required. This is very true. We, we do our best to educate the reviewers not to expect a lot of data. No detailed experimental plan is required. <clears throat> the budgets are flexible. People have successfully applied requesting about $200,000 in direct costs or close to $2 million in direct costs, whatever is really um, commensurate with the scope of what's being proposed. And we do get a lot of applications of uh, that propose 
budgets that are large, large being those exceeding $500,000 in direct costs in any given year. For those who do not need prior approval, you do need prior approval for many other uh, initiatives and grants at NIH for such large budgets, but not for the transformative research uh, award initiative because large budgets are built in to the FOA. The an important note is that the uh, transformative research award grant cannot be continued, cannot be renewed. So that is, there is no type two application for a transformative research award. You can submit uh, a subsequent transformative research award application, which should be different from your previous uh, transformative research award application, but you can't continue along the same trajectory of research. The overall intent of the program is to support outside the box ideas. And that is what the graphic there is intended to illustrate ideas, transformative ideas that are just bursting outside the box. Next question, please. Next slide, please. So we wanted to make the Transformative Research Award um, initiative different from the standard R01 in all important aspects, from application to review to administration. In terms of application, there are significant differences with, although the Transformative Research Award application uses the standard R01 application package, we use it in a very different way and the instructions uh, on how we're using it for this particular initiative are specified in the FOA. So please be sure that you read the FOA carefully. There are a lot of nuances, a lot of differences between a standard R01 and the transformative or transformative research award. For example, the uh, for a standard R01 application, there is a specific aim stage, of course, and usually the people are asked to uh, delineate or articulate two, three, or four specific aims that they hope to accomplish during the, during the project period. For the Transformative Research Award, we also use a specific aims page, but we use it in a very different way. Here we use it as a, ask the applicant to use it as a one-page distillation of, what, of uh, what's being proposed. What is the overall project? Why is it significant? What is the innovation that's inherent in the proposal? Uh, what is the key insight that's driving the, the proposal? and overall why it is well aligned with the spirit of the Transformative Research Award Initiative. The research strategy section, again, we have a 12 page section called the research strategy section, um, but we use it in a very different way than, than, than conventional NIH use. For the uh, standard R1, uh, people expect, or and reviewers expect a lot of details and data, but for the Transformative Research Award, we use it instead to address items of programmatic importance to the initiative. We ask five, sec uh, five sections to be addressed explicitly in the research strategy, strategy section. These are the overview of the research project, uh, you know, what is the context for the project approach, describe the underlying logic and, um, make, and, how, it will and how you will ensure robustness and rigor Innovation, explain why this is exceptionally innovative, something that you might not see uh, typically proposed in a standard R01 or something that might not fare well in standard R01 review. Appropriateness for TRA, for the Transformative Research Award application, why, some, why the Transformative Research Award rather than something that's more traditional. And then a timeline, including critical decision points. Next slide, please. So points to consider in the research strategy uh, section when you're when, when you're preparing it. So as Jim Lee, the, the, the scientific review officer for the Transformative Research Awards, will explain, the not all the reviewers will be topic experts. So when you write your uh, research strategy section, be sure that what you write can be easily appreciated by people well outside the field for exceptional innovation and potential for unusually broad impact. Those are the two real emphases for the, for the initiative. Exceptional innovation, potential for broad impact. Uh, and so in this review process, there will be, it's a multi-phase review process, but there will be people well outside the field. So if you're, for example, in neuroscience, you should be sure that somebody not in neuroscience can e easily apprehend. Uh, what's what's being proposed and say, oh, wow, that is so cool. They should be able to get the innovation 
and the potential impact without too much trouble. Begin with a description, and what I think works seems to work pretty well in uh, framing the research strategy section is to first provide a landscape of the field. What is the state of the art? What are, what are the current boundaries? To explain both to people who know something about the science, but people outside the that scientific field, to, to explain the the landscape of the field, and in that context, then describe why what what you're proposing and why that will extend well past current boundaries. Ease the reader into the jargon of the field. Don't just jump into all the abbreviations uh, quickly because not not everybody will know what what you're talking about then. Though, need, though no detailed experimental plan is required, make clear what it is that you want to do and why it's important to do. Uh, and convince the re readers that you have thought deeply about the project. For example, you definitely should identify what you think are the risky elements in the proposal and how they will be mitigated, for example, by alternate approaches. Also convince the reviewers that the research will be performed in a robust and rigorous manner. So you may not have thought through all the details, but you should demonstrate to the reviewers that you that um, you have thought in sufficient depth so that the research will be pursued in the most repro uh, reproducible, rigorous, uh, and robust manner possible. For example, if you're planning to use human subjects or animal subjects, you should include in the 12 page research strategy section an estimate of the number of subjects you'll need and why and that you've done a power analysis, for example, for example. And you should also include sex as a biological variable uh, if that is appropriate for what you're proposing. So, although we don't ask for a detailed experimental plan, the reviewers again need to have a clear idea of what it is you want to do overall and why it is important that and you should provide compelling logic. You, know, you just can't say, oh, I'm going to cure cancer or, or diabetes or Parkinson's. You have to uh, back it up with some pretty compelling reasoning. Okay, next slide, please. And I should add to that previous slide then that, uh, and to help you prepare that, uh, we, we rec the research strategy section, we recommend, it has stated in the FOA that you include a sentence prominently in the research strategy section that, that states that you're not providing substantial preliminary data or a detailed experimental plan because the FOA instructs you not to, not to provide those things or that those things are not necessary. And this statement then saying that you're not, that per the instructions in the FOA, you're not providing a lot of data or details, that helps not only you as the applicant, but we think it helps the reviewers as well to keep, uh, stay on track for the Transformative Research Award review. It's easy for these reviewers to slip into the R01 mindset, the standard R01 mindset, and start looking for details and data. But if you say it right there in the essay, in the, in the, section, the research strategy section, that, hey, this is a transformative research award application. I'm not providing a lot of de details and data. We think that is effective in keeping, in helping to keep the uh, reviewers on track. Next slide, okay, this slide, please. Uh, but I should say that we are piloting anonymized review for the transformative research award program, for the transformative research award initiative. You may know that we did this last year as well. This came about, or this was motivated by a working group that Dr. Collins convened for his advisory committee, the, the advisory committee to the NIH director. He tasked this working group in the advisory committee to evaluate the high risk, high reward research program total, in total. And uh, the, the, advisory, the working group found that the HRHR program is effective in supporting unusually innovative and impactful research. The working group also found that underrepresented groups overall are not adversely affected by the review processes that we use, which are quite unusual for NIH. But they identified a more fundamental concern, and that is that underrepresented groups do not apply at the rate which we might expect based on overall representation in the, um, in the research workforce in the nation, and that awards tend to go to a subset of institutions in the country. So one recommendation that the working group made and which we're following is to pilot anonymized review 
Next slide, please. So we have chosen to pilot anonymized review with the Transformative Research Award Initiative. The intention of the anonymized review pilot is to focus, uh, is to focus on the research idea, its innovativeness, and its potential impact. The investigator and environment criteria will be evaluated near the end of the multi-phase review process, but most of the review, but during most of the review, review, the identity of the participating investigators or institutions will not be known to the reviewers. We began this last year for uh, this year's awards, fiscal year 2021 awards, uh, and those had a receipt date in September 2020. Based on the results so far, the results are encouraging. We are we have commissioned a process evaluation of the of the anonymized review pilot, and the results indicate that a substantial fraction of those who applied last year for uh, this this fiscal year were incentivized to apply because they knew that we were going to employ the anonymized review process. And uh, the through a survey of applicants from last year. Uh, we found that the applicants were still felt that they were still able to overall that they were still able to prepare applications that conveyed innovation and, and impact in their proposal why it had uh, transformative potential through surveys of the reviewers we also found that the reviewers were still able to evaluate in, innovation and impact with the information at hand you know, although much of it was anonymized they could still say oh wow this this really does have the potential to transform the field Based on these results, then uh, we are planning to continue the pilot this year and maybe for, and probably for a third year. Next slide, please. So please be, since we are uh, using this unusual approach for, for uh, review, please be careful and read the FOA instructions very carefully, especially everything, but, uh, but I'd like to highlight the instructions for the anonymization. So, for the um, anonymization, we ask you as the applicants to anonymize the specific aims pages and the research strategy sections. Those are the only two components that need to be anonymized. And we provide instructions in the FOA that are given, that are listed here uh, as, to how, as to how we would like you to uh, anonymize them. So for example, in the specific aims page or the research strategy section, you should not mention the names of any individuals, of course, whether participating or not in the proposed research. So even if it's somebody who is not at all involved in the research strategy section, in the, in the proposed research, you still should not mention their name. Names of any institutions, whether participating or not. Again, even if it's not, if, even if you mention an, an, an institution that is not participating, you should not mention the, that institution unless that institution is um, providing a publicly available resource, such as a database or a biobank. You can say you know, the University of X uh, biobank will be accessed for these samples. Yeah, as long as it's publicly available, that sort of statement is okay. You should not say something like, we at the University of X will access our biobank. That would breach anonymity. So don't use anything like that. Uh, do not mention any honors or awards or other specific attributes of any participating investigator. Do not use hyperlinks, that's a general admonition for NIH applications. Uh, do not reference any investigator accomplishments in the public domain, including publications or in preprint servers, which means do not use language such as we develop this technology or we call this technology um, factor X or tri triple triple seek instead of triple sec. Okay, or the PIs demonstrated that our team was the first to do this, or our collab collaborators are pioneers in this field. Don't use language like that. Just try to keep it as anonymous as possible. Try to uh, comply with the spirit of the instructions. Citations should. Uh, that provides specific information about the source should not be used. You can't use uh, the, the journal or the, any of the author's names in the citation in the research strat strategy section. 
you can refer to citations in the bibliography and citation component by using numbers. For example, you, you know, just number them sequentially and the number should correspond to a publication in the, in the bibliography and citation component, but don't provide any more information than that about the, about the uh, reference. And as a catch all, any other text from which the identity of any participating individual or institution can be reasonably inferred. And as a warning, inclusion of any such information um, may will result in the application being administratively withdrawn. So this applies to both the specific aims page and the research strategy section. Next slide, please. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. Be sure to follow the anonymization instructions care carefully. Examine the specific aims page and the research strategy section to make sure that there are no violations in the text. Uh, better to comply with the spirit of an anonymization than to try to game the system, try to sneak in some some uh, some language that you think might pass. But you know, just try to comply with with what we're trying to accomplish. Complete all the other components of the application, though, following the standard SF424 application guide. Other components do not need to be anonymized. Of course, the bias you are uh, required to provide bias sketches. Uh, don't anonymize those, of course or the um, human subjects, animal subjects, uh, leadership plan, none of those need to be anonymized, only the two components. Uh, people from last year had a, a frequent question from last year as well, where do I uh, describe the suitability for the team in, in uh, pursuing the proposed research? So we ask you to use the bias sketches to, uh, to provide that information, describe the investigator suitability uh, in the bias sketch. Next slide, please. That's it for me. I'll hand it over to James Lee, who will describe the review process. James Lee, PhD, Scientific Review Officer, NIH Center for Scientific Review, begins his presentation on the review process for the NIH Director's Transformative Research Award. <sighs> okay, thanks, Ravi. <sighs> Thank you, everyone, for joining today. So, uh, Maybe you'll just go to the next slides. Okay, so here's a, a, a slide to show an overall a review process. Uh, it's a multi-stage editorial board review process for the uh, Transformative Research Award review. Uh, this is the same process uh, we've been using since 2009 and uh, through a, a multi-stages. Uh, multi and uh, in addition, as Ravi, uh, uh, mentioned early that uh, NIH is a piloting an anonymized review process where the identity of the uh, PI and institution were not disclosed to the reviewer until the last uh, stage of the review process, just a, a couple of weeks before the final review discussion. So in the uh, phase one review, uh, the editorial board review uh, panel were only have the access to the uh, specific aim page, right? And uh, they will select a subset of application that move to the phase two review. In the phase two review, the subject matter expert, uh, which is we recruit as a male reviewer, will review your application on the specific aim page and the research strategy section and provide a comments. They were um, then that once that phase two complete, the uh, review comments will be uh, going back to the editorial and board review panel. At that point in the phase 3A, uh, they will um, have access to the uh, specific aim page, research strategy section, as well as the corresponding mail review comments, right? And they will do a, a second round of review and select a further subset of uh, application uh, for discussion in the final phase. So at that point, the application will be unblind and the review panel will once again go back to the entire complete application to review all the standard uh, NH review criteria that's include uh, you know investigator uh, uh, research environment you know the bio sketches and, and uh, vertebral animal um, human subject a multi pi plan and so on and so forth so that's become uh, just like a regular study session a regular review where they will have access to the entire application 
So uh, if you look, look at the overall process, the phase one to three A will be a anonymized review where the reviewer only have access to the anonymized section, which is the, the specific aim page and the research stress section. Only at the end, uh, uh, during the review, uh, two weeks before the review discussion, they will have access to the complete application. So that's the overall uh, review process. I'm gonna just give a little more detail for each step. So, so um, I have the next slice. Slide stating 150 to 200 applications will be received. The timeline for phase one includes NIH admin review, which will take place from early to mid September, 2021 and phase one review, which will take place from late September to late November, 2021. Okay, so in the um, phase one review, you know, the editorial board review panel is composed of a, uh, depending on the number of applications, typically 16 to 20 senior scientists, you know, with a broad uh, expertise covering sort of diverse scientific area that's generally funded by the NIH research portfolio, right? And each editor will review about 40 to 50 applications. And uh, uh, this is based on the specific aim page which is a used as a sort of high level distillation of the, uh, the research idea and the overall concept, right? They were access, uh, um, they were uh, evaluate why, you know, this is exceptionally innovative and uh, it's, you know, transformative potential impact, right? Obviously at that stage, uh, they are not considering uh, any technical details or any preliminary data, uh, you know, at that point, you know, it's a very high level assessment initially. Uh, each application is reviewed and scored by four editorial board members, right? And the top scoring subset of application plus any rescues uh, advance to the phase, uh, phase two. Well, what I mean by rescue, if you know the entry review system is that uh, uh, even some of the application, maybe the average score are in the lower half, but any editor, if they look at the uh, apps uh, specific for aim pages, they found this was uh, something that was really interesting, uh, you know, has transformative potential, and they can rescue that application and move that uh, to the next phase. So, anyway, so uh, may I have the next slide, please? Slide stating phase two review will take place from December 2021 to mid February 2022. Okay, so in the phase two review, right, the, typically the top 70, 80 um, application are selected from phase one and reviewed by the uh, topic expert, which is a male reviewer uh, <clears throat> in the areas of science that are presented in each application, right? Each application is reviewed by three uh, male reviewer who have access to the anonymized specific aim page and the research strategy section. Right. So as an applicant, um, I think it, uh, you need to prepare the application. Just keep that in mind. At that stage, they will not have access to the rest of the application, such as a, a reference, a citation, and so on and so forth. So you have to, you know, all the key information, and you have to make sure it's self-contained in those two sections so they can evaluate effectively. Right. The male reviewer will provide comments you know, address uh, significance and transformative impact, uh, you know, the level of information, uh, the level of innovation and the logic of the approach, despite the, you know, limited primary data and, and not expected uh, in the application. Yep. Uh, next slide, please. Slide stating 70 to 80 applications will progress to phase 3A. Phase 3A review will take place from late February to late March 2022. Okay, so when the uh, male reviewer, uh, which is the technical expert, uh, complete their review, the their comments are going back, the applications are going back to the editor uh, board review panel. At that point, they were access the anonymized specific aim page, research strategy section, as well as uh, the corresponding mail review critique from the uh, phase two, right? Each editor at this point will assign uh, typically 15 to 20 applications. They will review and provide a preliminary score, taking into account both their own assessment as well as taking into account the, 
the input from the mail reviewer. And generally, the top half of the application at this stage were, um, you know, from from this set, uh, plus any rescues again, uh, bought up, uh, you know, advanced to the final review discussion uh, in the phase three B in early April. Uh, next slide. Slide stating the number of applications will progress to phase three B is unknown. Phase three B review will take place in early April, 2022. Okay, so uh, once they complete uh, the phase three A, the application will be unblind. Uh, so then the editor board review panel will have uh, you know full access to the complete application. We'll consider five standard review criteria, including investigator environment, you know, and uh, as well as a human subject vertebrate animal, a multi PA plan. Uh, uh, you know, for the final review discussion, uh, the editor, after uh, seeing the entire application, also uh, have options to rescue any applications. And uh, uh, at the final review meeting, they will provide a final overall impact score after the review discussion, taking into account both their own assessment of the entire application and input from the panel discussion, as well as the input from the mail review. That will be done. The final review discussion will be done in early April uh, next year. So that's a sort of the, uh, I guess, a somewhat uh, brief overview of the entire this multi-stage uh, review process. Slide showing the Q and A section of the webinar begins. Thank you both uh, for your sharing the information that you just did. We will now move on to the question and answer section of the webinar. Uh, prior to the actual webinar, we received questions through the Transformative Research Award inbox. So we have those that are ready to go. If you have additional questions, please add them to the Q&A box. I already see that some questions have been coming in there. We will try our best to get to them if time permits. As I mentioned earlier, if we do not get to them, please make use of that TRA inbox to email your questions to us, and we will be sure to get an answer out to you. So the email address is listed on the slide bottom right. So with that being said, let's answer some of the questions that you have. And for this, I'd love Ravi and James to join us. Ravi, I am going to start with you. What is meant by transformative research? Good question. I wish I knew the answer. Well, it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a fuzzy concept of transformative. It's, it uh, refers to having a very broad impact on a field. And to do that, you need to bring in new ideas, new concepts, perhaps apply new technologies, develop new technologies, be innovative in how you're going to change a field. Thank you. I am going to stick with you for the next question. Are multiple PIs allowed to apply? And are individuals or teams preferred? Yes, single PI applications, multi PI applications are both welcome. And uh, you should use whatever you think is really appropriate for the project. There is no preference for single PI or multi PI applications. Mm -hmm. We've done analyses uh, and about the review, and there seems to be no preference for one or the other. Thank you. Great. Okay, James, I'm going to shift over to you for this next question. What issues should be considered when thinking about an application to the Transformative Research Award? What issue? Yes. Well, I think uh, I thought this is maybe more of a you mean review related issues or yeah, like what are some things that reviewers look for when they are looking at a transformative research application? Oh, okay, okay. So basically, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, RFA, if you look at the past award uh, project, right? Really, it's looking for something that a uh, it's a, uh, you know, has a broad impact as uh, Ravi alluded to earlier. It's really, 
uh, you know, groundbreaking, unconventional, and a transformative research, right? They're really not looking for conventional. It's like, uh, you know, with quite a bit of extensive preliminary data, you know, it's a, it's a solid potential. It could be high impact in a regular study session, but it's just a somewhat incremental changes uh, versus of what's out there. So I think that's what a typically reviewer is looking at. It's a somewhat uh, unique ideas where, you know, Whenever I read it, maybe you say, well, why I haven't thought about that idea. So I think that's a something I find that's to be uh, the case. In most cases, what I see, at least that's what a reviewer is looking for. Ravi, do you have anything you want to add or does that kind of cover it all? That covers it pretty well. Great. Okay, next question. Are applications proposing clinical research appropriate for this award? And Ravi, you can pick this one up. Yes, they can be appropriate. We don't get that many clinical research applications. I think one reason is that you know, this is supposed to be high risk, high reward research. Not all the details will be worked out yet. And if you're going to use human subjects, you have to be pretty careful in how you're going to go about doing that. But it's still possible if you have an idea and the research will be conducted uh, safely effectively, robustly, rigorously, then it's still possible. Uh, and if you are considering proposing clinical research, then we highly recommend that you contact uh, someone. So we in the FOA, we have a link to a list of contacts for discussing clinical research uh, based on the most relevant institute at NIH. So we recommend that you look at that list and speak with the appropriate person listed uh, as a contact for the most relevant institute at NIH. And he or she will, and the main reason for this is that is uh, if a transformative research award application is to be funded, it will be administered by the scientifically most relevant institute. And if the institute is to manage that clinical research, it has to comply with the clinical research policies of that institute. And as you know, the clinical research policies vary from institute to institute. So you should be sure that when you're preparing your application, that whatever you're proposing would conform to the clinical research policies of the scientifically most relevant institute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, James, I'm gonna send this one your way. What scientific areas are eligible to apply or are there particular scientific areas that do well with reviewers? Okay, so this is, a, I think, a Ravi already covered the at the, the early talk. Is all scientific, you know, area that's relevant to NH mission are eligible to apply. So there's no one particular area that was, say, prefer versus the other. And as far as the review panel, uh, we have a very diverse uh, a panel with, uh, you know, different type of expertise that's essentially cover all the area that's you know, within the NIH portfolio, so. All, all science scientific areas under the NIH mission are eligible to apply, bottom yeah. line. Yeah, Okay, Thank you. next question, Ravi, will technology development be allowed or just hypothesis-driven research? No, we do support quite a bit of technology-driven um, research. Um, and so, which means that it can be also hypothesis generating research, not just, or discovery driven research, not just hypothesis driven research. But most successful applicants, when they're proposing a technology, will also propose uh, an application or two to demonstrate the utility of the technology that's to be developed. So, they want to establish a paradigm, and to establish that paradigm, they're using one or two model systems. Great, thank you. Okay, so no awards have been made for my area of science. Does that mean my science area is not competitive or an interest to the program? Ravi? No, as Makiba said <laughs> uh, <laughs> earlier in the, in the webinar, just because your area is not listed as a, an area that's been supported by the Transformative Research Award Program should not be a disincentive for you to apply. 
uh, may actually serve as an incentive. We are trying to diversify the scientific portfolio of the Transformative Research Award Initiative. And so we do take that into consideration when we're making funding decisions. Does it really enhance the scientific diversity of what we support? And another consideration is cross-cutting. So you should also, when you're thinking of ideas to submit, make sure that it's also would be considered cross-cutting that would have a broad potential impact. Okay, great. Can for-profit small businesses apply? Are they less likely to be awarded than an academic institution? Ravi. Yes, for-profit institutions can can apply even if they're not making a profit. <laughs> um, and there seems to be no bias for or against small businesses. We just don't get so many applications from them. I think part of it is that you know, you, they may not have the same sort of uh, there, there can be proprietary issues and such that might discourage small companies from applying, but they do occasionally apply. Okay, so Ravi, we are seeing several questions coming in of this nature, which is, what is the difference between the Pioneer and the Transformative Research Award? We do have a nice table uh, prepared by Becky Miller that's on our website to explain uh, similarities and differences between the four initiatives, but between the Pioneer Award and the and the Transformative Research Award, the, the salient differences are that the Pioneer Award is single PI application applicant only. The budget is fixed at seven hundred thousand dollars in direct costs per year, and um, it's more a project. It's more a person based award. So the the qualities of the investigator weigh more heavily than usual in, in uh, review. For the Transformative Research Award Program, single PI or multi-PI applications are welcome. The budgets are flexible. You can request whatever budget you think you really need to conduct the research that you're proposing. And uh, especially through the anonymized review process, we're trying to make the emphasis more on the idea and its innovation. innovation. Innovativeness and uh, potential impact. So, to follow up on that, another question is: Is it then possible to uh, to propose the same project for both the Pioneer Award and the Transformative Research Award? No, uh, no, you cannot submit substantially the same idea uh, twice, and that they can't be under review at the same time. People have uh, submitted. Pioneer Award applications and TRA applications in the same cycle, but they have to be substantially different ideas. And um, I just had a question come in, Ravi, to clarify something that you said, a word you used, which is cross-cutting. Uh, the question is wondering, does that mean that it has to include the behavioral science bucket? No, it doesn't have to be that cross-cutting, but one way to define cross-cutting is, is it germane to the mission of multiple institutes, for example? Or does it, right. yeah, Go ahead. The, just the breadth of, that's another way to say breadth of potential impact, but it doesn't have to encompass the entire broad mission of NIH. Okay, and another question, I applied last time and was not funded and received no feedback. Is there any point in applying again with the same transformative idea? Um, yes, perhaps you, oh. Ravi, you can start and James, you can add in from a reviewer's sure. point of view. Uh, yes, I think if you really believe in your idea, if you're passionate about it, then you might consider applying again. Important thing to point out though, is that each application is, is considered a new application. There are no type A1 applications that are submitted. There's no history. Uh, and if, so if you do submit another application, please be sure that you do not reference any previous application or review. If you do, then that can be grounds for administratively withdrawing the application. 
Yeah, so the only thing I want to add is, is the importance of a specific aim page, right? I think uh, Ravi already covers quite extensive at the beginning. It's a different than traditional R1, not just a list uh, several tasks or aims you want to accomplish. You have to really convey in that page, you know, why your project, why your application has a transform to a potential. And also keep in mind, um, you have to address this in a, a, a way that uh, even people not necessarily in direct your scientific field can appreciate uh, that because that's the, the key when the phase one reveal, uh, you know, when they were, uh, when they evaluate, they thought there was a transform potential that move on to the next phase with a, you know, technical review. And to elaborate a bit more on, on the question, the person asked, well, said that they received no critiques, uh, essentially. Right. So, for in the yeah. summary statement, then how how far you get in the review process? What what is in the summary statement depends on how far you get in the review process. If you don't make it to the second phase, then your summary statement will contain only the um, a summary of the review process. No evaluative comments. No critiques. If you make it to the second phase, then you'll get the technical reviews from phase two reviewers. Uh, if you and if your uh, application is discussed and scored then you'll get a resume and summary of discussion as well as the individual critiques from phase two. Yeah. So be prepared to not get anything back because at least half of them won't get any critiques in the summary statements. Okay, thank you both. The last question that relates to eligibility for this section is, is the award renewable? And Ravi, you can take this one. No, it is not renewable. There's no, you can't, there's, as I said earlier, there are no type two applications. You cannot renew a transformative research award application uh, award project. You can certainly submit another one, but you can't renew one. And if you do submit another one, it shouldn't be a natural extension of, of what you've been doing before. All right, let's move on to the next subset of questions, which are related to application and submission. So the first question, uh, can you provide an example application to look at? Ravi? Yes, they're on our website. Great. Uh, how can I get help? On, I'm, oh, I'm, go I'm ahead. Not sure. I'm not sure if they're anonymized examples yet, but uh, yeah, but at least examples of pre anonymized <laughs> applications are available. Yeah, we can work on that. Yeah. Okay. How can I get help with my application? Ravi. Well, if you want to discuss the scope of what you're proposing, I'm not sure exactly what help means, but if you want to discuss the scope of the overall idea, then I'm available for such discussions. If it's technical in nature, then you might want to uh, su submit your question to the Transformative Awards mailbox. And then in any case, you're, uh, you'll get a response from that inbox, probably from Akiba. And, Either referring you, either responding to your question directly, or referring you to somebody else who might who might be uh, better suited or more appropriate. Uh, next question: Do I need to submit a specific aims page? And James kind of touched on this earlier, so James, you can start on the importance of that, and Ravi, you can follow up if needed. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, you do need a specific in page, right? So that's good, is going to be um, revealed in the phase one, where the editorial board review a member will look at that uh, just to see. Uh, you know, basically, it's a high level review uh, uh, to see the you know potential, you know, transformative potential for that uh, page. And also, uh, I just want to emphasize uh, that again: make sure you do not contain a potentially identifiable information in that page. Otherwise, it will be administratively withdrawn your application, so. Um, so with that being said, we had another question that wanted some clarification on how to de-identify. The question is that if the technology was developed by the PI, then if they cannot see that, how do they Introduce the technology. How do they see that? 
They can still describe the technology, definitely, but they cannot claim to have developed the technology. So they should not use, for example, we developed uh, technology X, which we call technology X. Right. You know, especially if it's in the public domain, they should not use any language like that. They can say, we will use technology X, which has been demonstrated to fulfill these requirements or possess these capabilities. But they can't claim ownership of the technology. Perfect. Uh, Ravi, I'll stick with you. How large should the proposal, the proposed project be? It, it all depends on what you're really thinking about in, in terms of large, in terms of budget. Again, people have submitted applications successfully for $200,000 or you know, closer to 2 million. We set aside maybe 8 million or so each year for, for some uh, for competing applications for supporting competing applications. Nobody's gone for the entire pot of money yet, but uh, no. <laughs> but be careful. Just and but just. But uh, my counsel is to is to make a proposal still lean and mean. You know, just propose what actually you need to uh, to do to demonstrate uh, the transformativeness of what you're proposing. So, uh, a oh, common error is that, pe that there's ambition creep or scope creep. People start, oh, there's no budget limit. I'll just throw in this too. And that, that makes the proposal too diffuse. Okay. Uh, and what about page limits? Someone had a question that they couldn't find page limits online for the proposal. Are there page limits? There are, but there are because they, we comply with the SF 424 instructions which means that we don't need to provide any additional information for the specific games page. It's the page for the research strategy section. It's still 12 pages. James, I'll come over to you for this one. Do applications fare better if they include preliminary data? Uh, I guess a yes or no, right? So in the sense, if you have some preliminary data, when technical reviewer uh, see uh, see the application, there's a there's a somewhat comfort level as far as feasibility and so on and so forth. However, just keep in mind, if there's a too many, too sort of extensive preliminary data, it's kind of a, in the sense, you know, is this a kind of a well-known area of science already? Um, so is it like a, seems like a, can be predicted, uh, pre, you know, that sort of thing. So it can be against you, um, in that sense. Um, and does the presence of preliminary data count against the innovativeness of the proposal? I think, it, I think it, it depends on how the preliminary data are presented or, or or collected in the application, right? If you have everything, it, it seems like a quite extensive preliminary data, like a typical R1, and the risk is a minimum. It seems it's going to, you know, already everything is there. Then people might say, well, you know, it seems like this is just a, a incremental changes to what's already out there. Mm -hmm. Ravi, do you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I agree with James with what you said. There's, you know, most people do provide some data uh, and to give what I call a glimmer of hope that whatever is being proposed might actually be feasible. And there is a danger in providing too much data uh, and that it can be counterproductive. If everything looks feasible, then the reviewers might, and they often, and in such cases, they often do say, well, everything looks like it's going to work. This is not suited for a tra transformative research award, but more a conventional R01. Uh, then definitely you don't need it. There have been cases where no data have been provided and still were, were awarded. So a little bit of data probably could be a good thing. Too much data probably would be a bad thing. Okay, so we have quite a few questions coming in about the Anonymization process. Uh, 
we can start here. What components of the application must be anonymized and what kind of information is forbidden? And Ravi, you've touched at the, on that throughout, but folks are really wondering if the bio sketch is included, how can this remain anonymous? The only two components that need to be anonymized are the specific games page and the research strategy section. All other components do not need to be anonymized. This, of course, includes the bio sketch, the animal subjects, if you're using animal subjects section, uh, human subjects, if you're using human subjects, uh, uh, leadership plan, resources, everything else, facilities and environment, all those, they do not need to be anonymized. Only the two sections, specific games, page, and the research strategy need to be anonymized. And when does the bio sketch come into review for the reviewers? James, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So I think it's um, it's like a two weeks, approximately two weeks before uh, the final uh, review discussion. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, if you recall the slides, I guess you can go back and look at the slides. It's a what we call a phase three B. Then the, at that point, the application will be unblind, and then the reviewer at that point will access the entire complete application. So they can see the bio sketch, they can see, you know, everything essential to the complete application. And then uh, they will um, review the, the entire application, consider all the standard criteria, you know, for the final review score, for the final you know, uh, overall impact score. Right. Um... So a question that came in, should we not be referring to our own publications then in the proposal to demonstrate expertise? Yes, you can't claim anything that's in the public domain. For example, you cannot say we have published this particular result. Even if you give just a numeric citation, you cannot say that that is yours if it's in the public domain, if it's published or even in a preprint server or somehow or a patent somehow known or accessible to the public. You can say that you're basing your proposal uh, based on these findings as reported in the literature, but you can't say that those are your findings. You can, again, explain how you're well suited for the research that you're proposing in the bio sketch. That's, this is where you explain why you're eminently qualified for what you've proposed, why you and your team are eminently qualified. Okay, we have another question wondering if a bio sketch is required and I will just ask it so we can repeat it one more time. One more time, yes, a bio sketch <laughs> is required. So the only two components that need to be anonymized are the specific games page and the research strategy section. You need to complete all the other appropriate sections of the application, including uh, biosketches and uh, human subjects, vertebrate animals, biohazards, whatever else pertains to your proposal, you need to complete following the standard SF-424 instructions. There's no need to anonymize those components. Okay, and final question of this bucket for application and submission. Can a PI submit multiple proposals on different topics? Yes. Great. <laughs> on, to the, on to the next section. Okay, so this next section of questions will focus on budget. First question, how much can I ask for? And Ravi, I will send this your way. The budgets are flexible for this initiative. So you can, again, request whatever you think you really need. Uh, the average re request for direct costs is about $650,000, $700,000 a year. So you can be pretty ambitious in, in, your, what, in the scope of your proposal. But again, you should make the budget fit the scope. And again, make the, make the proposal sufficiently lean so that you have it's a, it, um, pretty concrete objectives. Next question, do I need NIH approval before submitting a budget exceeding 500,000 in annual direct costs? No. Okay. 
James, I will send this your way. Are foreign components allowed? Are you... Maybe you can yeah. start and Ravi can answer. Yes, uh, yes. A foreign component uh, allowed, but a foreign institution are not allowed as an outlying RFA, right, Ravi? Yep. Right. So the PIs all have to be at domestic U.S. domestic institutions. You can have collaborators at foreign institutions. That's totally fine, but they cannot be a PI on the application. Okay, and final question for this bucket on budget: How much time? effort are recipients expected to devote? Ravi. Whatever seems reasonable, there's no minimum or maximum uh, percent effort that's required for transformative research awards. So, but it has to be reasonable. If it's, a, if it's an ambitious project, then don't, don't, uh, don't declare that you know, you're gonna spend two weeks per year on it. Probably will not review well. All right. So the final subset of questions are related to the review process. And James, I'm going to put you center stage for this. Ravi, you can fill in wherever you need to. Uh, there are several questions. So let's try to get through it. Do I need to suggest a study section for my application? Uh, no. Uh, basically, as long as you use the correct RFA number, uh, once it's uh, uh, processed by receive referral, it will be assigned to a special uh, study session, special panel. All application in response to this year's uh, uh, TR uh, transformative research RFA will be go to the same special panel. So you don't have to specify which one uh, you need to be. Perfect. Uh, Ravi. Why is NIH piloting an anonymized review process? What is the goal? The goal is, what is uh, the major goal is this regards the high risk, high reward research program. We're not getting the diversity of applicants or institutions that we might expect based on the composition of the national research workforce. So the anonymization is to help in two aspects. One is to reduce any perceived or any existing or, or perceived bias that might exist. And the other is, is to uh, provide positive reinforcement for people who are thinking about applying. If they are coming from uh, not your typical institution that's extremely research intensive, and they, they might be discouraged from applying, especially when looking at the previous uh, awards and awardees, but if, if they know that it's going to be anonymized, then they might go ahead and apply. And that's something that we're actually seeing as an encouraging trend based on the first year pilot. So it's so the second point is to increase the diversity of applicants. And diversity in all sorts of aspects, um, including geographic location, type of institution, and so forth. Um, next question, James. How will reviewers be able to adequately evaluate the applications without knowing who the investigators are or the institutions? Okay, so if you look at the RFA, um, the, the for the uh, you know transformative uh, RFA, right? So it's a it's a really a project a focus uh, the review, right? So at the early phase of the process, you know the emphasis is really on the sort of transformative potential of the proposed research and its concept ideas, right? And the investigator and team qualification and research environment will be, uh, you know, what's not considered at the early stage, obviously, but will be considered at the end when we unblind the application, then, uh, then the review panel will see the entire application. At that point, you know, uh, they will be considered. So to follow up on that, um, questions are coming in wondering how can reviewers fairly evaluate the validity of an idea without citation references? So, so unlike a, I guess unlike the conventional, the typical R1 where you tend to have a lot of preliminary data and a lot of, some publications, some maybe already published, and for the you know transformative. Uh, um, 
you know, highly innovative uh, idea, a lot of the project, it tend to be in the early phase, so to speak. So it's, um, so citation of the reference sometimes is not as critical and uh, in the early phase of the review. And uh, we also uh, rely on a group of um, a senior scientists that serve on the panel where they have a broad perspective and broad expertise to uh, look at the um, ideas. You know, sometimes it's because they are really not looking at the very technical detail at the beginning of the, re at the earliest uh, phase of the review. So those references is less critical, but, uh, but the critical reference, they will look at it at the end when we unblind the application. Also, we encourage, uh, uh, I think it's also outlined the RFA instruction that uh, all the critical idea or data, preliminary data should be presented in your 12 page research strategy. So it's as much as self-contained as possible to convey your idea, to convey your preliminary data. Okay. Um, I'm gonna come over to Ravi for the next question. Ravi, what happens if a reviewer guesses the identity of the applicant? It's actually better suited for Jim. <laughs> okay, Jim. Okay. What would so, you do? So based on our experience last year, the editor board member generally it's not a that doesn't seem to be a concern. They will they generally will uh, were not able to identify who the applicant is. However, for the technical reviewer, uh, sometimes as you, you expect it because they are subject matter expert in the field, there will be cases where sometimes uh, they were able to, uh, I guess, get a general sense where the, the applications are submitted by different by certain labs or institution. So in those cases, uh, if we find out early, we will try to uh, identify alternative uh, mail reviewer to review that application. But um, as part of this a pilot, right, also we work with the, um, the STIPI, who's an outside agency to evaluate uh, this anonymized review process. So we do keep in track, we do keep track, you know, how many cases were the reviewer were able to identify and, and there were, so that's going to be part of our feedback and we're going to, you know, once we finish the pilot in three years, uh, then we're going to decide what we do with this. If we decided, you know, this is going to be, whether this will be a permanent process or not. So, uh, what would happen uh -huh. if identifying information is accidentally included by the PI in the specific aims or the, re the research strategy section? I think that those applications will be administratively withdrawn without being reviewed. Yes. So we do have an internal committee that was assembled to go through all the transformative research award applications to make sure that they were responsive to the instructions. So we internally we take a close look at the applications to make sure that they are responsive. It is it, there have been a few heartbreaking cases, I agree, where they just slipped in the name somehow inadvertently in our caption. And we have to withdraw the application. There's no, there's no mechanism for submitting uh, revised or corrected applications. So please be careful before you submit. Please be careful. Okay. Um, James touched on this a little bit by talking about STIPI, but um, Science Technology Policy Institute. Ravi, a question: Is the anonymized review process permanent? Will it be evaluated? Uh, we are trying the pilot for probably three years. That's our initial uh, intention. And then we will evaluate at the end of the three year period to determine whether or not we'll continue it, whether to whether it's suitable for scaling up to other initiatives. Um, and we have commissioned the Science and Technology Policy Institute, which is an independent agency to evaluate the process and the yeah, the and the resulting uh, award applications and awards. Thank you. James, questions are coming in about how are reviewers selected? Um, so it's a, just like a um, most of ancient study session, right? We first, it's based on their scientific expertise and for the transformative uh, review panel, we are looking for 
uh, you know, senior scientists with a, you know, the, the panel is a really broad expertise and, a, you know, accomplishment in their own uh, respective research field and uh, also a different scientific field, right? Also uh, demographic and geographic diversity, a different represent, obviously represent, you know, from a different institution that's also considered uh, to, um, you know, to represent uh, selected on the editorial board review panel. For the technical reviewer, I think the same standard apply, except uh, generally that's a better consideration as far as matching the expertise versus the application being reviewed versus their own research for the technical mail review. And um, question, will a subject review, sorry, a subject expert review my application, James? Uh, as you know, if you recall the, 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 the brief uh, process we went through, if you pass, if the application were selected in the phase one, moved to the phase two, then that will be reviewed by, a, um, you know, technical review or a subject matter expert review. If it's not, then generally it's not a review. Great. So question, is it possible or may I request to exclude a specific reviewer with whom I have a conflict of interest. It is possible, uh, just like a, this is a sort of the same practice as a general as an applicant. An applicant, you cannot uh, unlike a journal review, right? You cannot suggest who's supposed to review your application, but you can list potential conflict in your cover letter, or and give a uh, you know brief reason to say why I have a conflict with this particular reviewer, either due to personal or professional reasons. And, and your request will be considered. Okay. Um, a next question, is it okay to contact previous reviewers to review my grant application prior to submission? I think it's better uh, if you're thinking about submitting an application, right? You can talk to probably your collaborator or your colleague, senior colleague to get a general sense about the uh, the science you want to you know put in with your application, right? As far as uh, if you wanted to know a little bit more about the review process, such a logistic review process, you know you can feel free to just contact us. I think the the reviewer who served previously on the on, on the panel were instructed, you know, they signed the agreement that they would not disclose all the specific details of the review, and uh, you know. I think it's okay for them to talk of a very general term, but it's better if you wanted to know that logistically of the review process, it's better to talk to us rather than talk to one of the previous review member because you could put them in a very awkward, difficult position. Okay. Um, another question which we're see I'm seeing quite a bit of what will the primary focus be? Of the review, what are reviewers looking for? I think we covered this a short times. So it's a just a uh, basically the reviewer is looking for this particular RFA, right? If you look at the uh, RFA, and also they can look at the previously funded um, a project. You're really looking for groundbreaking, unconventional, you know, transformative research that can substantially different than, you know, what the current mainstream sort of research ideas, right? It's potential to create a new scientific paradigm or establish the entire new and significantly improve the pro approach versus what's out there. You know, focus on highly innovative ideas rather than experimental details. Mm -hmm. And uh, not looking for a conventional R1 with, you know, extensive preliminary data, you know, it's just incremental changes. That's not what they're looking for. So. Okay, Ravi, I have a question for you. Uh, will awards be selected based on scores or at the dis discretion of the program director? Um, so the funding plan is developed using a hybrid of approaches. Most of the awards that the that will be made for the transformative award research award initiative are funded by the common fund, and for most of the awards that the common fund makes they will be based on the priority score. But the common fund does set aside a substantial amount of funds 
uh, to support applications based on programmatic priorities. Those programmatic priorities are listed in, near the end of the FOA. They are uh, the opportunity for making big advance in science, the, whether the uh, application represents uh, an opportunity to invigorate innovative science broadly across the nation, wh wh whether the, the uh, proposal is cross-cutting in nature, as we've discussed before, and whether it helps to improve the scientific diversity in the portfolio of science that's supported by the Transformative Research, uh, Research Award Initiative. So the Common Fund will make those awards mostly large, uh, mostly based on party score, but a substantial fraction based on these programmatic priorities. In addition, the institutes at NIH have the opportunity to support applications of their choice, and that's a pretty independent funding stream. They, the institutes can choose to support any application that they wish to support, even if it's something that the Common Fund would have otherwise supported. And that allows the Common Fund to go further down its prioritized list. We do have a question that is related to eligibility that I think it would be really important for folks to hear the answer to, which is what is the most common career stage of awardees? Is it feasible for an early career researcher to apply for the TRE? Most of the applicants and awardees tend to be fairly well established, that is, associate professor to full professor. Um, we do certainly get applications and do make awards to early career stage investigators, but the fraction of those who apply uh, and are early stage tend to be pretty small. Maybe if I can provide broader context, uh, the overall success rate for the Transformative Research Award Program is about 5%, so it's really quite competitive. Keep that in mind, too. I mean, we, we want you to propose what you think are your coolest ideas, your most innovative ideas. You don't need a lot of details worked out yet. You don't need data. So that's that could be quite suitable for early career stage investigators who, who haven't had the time or the resources to generate a lot of data, but have a really powerful idea that they want to pursue. Right. That was actually, you just covered the next question, which is, is the funding rate about the same as the DP2, about 5%? Uh, no, the DP2 is higher. It's about 8 to 10 percent. There we go. So the DP2 is 8 to 10 percent, and the TRA is even lower than that. So 5 percent. Okay. So we have, I think, looking at the time, covered quite a lot. We did have a few questions in there that are more specific as to ideas. Please go ahead and send an email to the TRA inbox. And next slide, I think folks have mentioned that they're not quite able to see that address for the TRA inbox. And there it is on the screen right there, transformative underscore awards at mail.nih.gov. So any questions that we were unfortunately unable to get to, please be sure to send an email and we will get an answer out to you. So as we wrap up, I would like to thank everyone for joining us as well as our informed panel. The webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the website at commonfund.nih.gov slash TRE. So as I mentioned just recently, email us. We are here ready and willing to answer your questions. And we sincerely look forward to receiving lots of transformative applications for this funding opportunity. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.